thanks for coming. Sorry, we started a bit late. Uh, uh, we didn't have the opportunity to use the room downstairs. So today is a little bit more intimate. Right? We are a lot closer to each other. Uh, we will keep the door open just in case uh, there's a spillover. Uh, we are really lucky today to have Joe. Right? Uh, Joe, Joe actually is my personal coach. Right? Uh, uh, we actually uh, will be yes. going into sessions uh, with, with him. And, uh, and so, so are my kids as well. Right? I think, I think, uh, I think the whole idea of presentation uh, and presenting is actually yourself is actually very critical in this time and age, right? And any age you guys have, right, as a startup or as a student, right, to actually present your case, right, will give you the the, the next leap, right, in, into some something else, right? Yesterday I went to a pitch. I was just telling Joe, right, uh, uh, there were ten startups all together, and uh, it was totally dramatic. Uh, is like the tech equivalent, uh, you know, right? They will open their ends, like what you say, you know, exactly to the T, right? How many fingers in, how many fingers out, you know? Um, <laughs> after a while, after 10, the first presentation was good, but after 10, it gets a little bit too dramatic to, for me, right? Uh, because the soul wasn't there, mm -hmm. right? It, it was just pure, say this, do that, you know, right? And, and, and so on. So I think Joe will give you some tips towards that, that direction, but I think it's more importantly, right, you guys have to understand the content you guys are giving out, right, because that actually does the whole package together, right. Uh, so without, uh, I, I actually have not introduced Joe, right, I mean, Joe, Joe is, uh, for most of us our age, right, <laughs> Joe is pretty well known, right, right, Joe, Joe is one of the top, uh, I would say, uh, radio program in Singapore, oh. right, uh, almost a decade ago, Right, which is the uh, gold and uh, class 95. Um, every show, show. Uh, 25 right. years of radio. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's, it's every single one, right? Uh, but I think what uh, uh, really stood out was uh, your, your, your your morning show, right? right. Which which I think uh, I think set the same uh, the, the standard uh, completely different, right? I mean, they, actually Joe and his team was the one that set the standard mm -hmm. for the show, right? Uh, so I think it's actually uh, we are actually quite. Uh, Fortunate to have him here, else it will cost you 500 bucks at least. <laughs> to sit inside here, right? So, so he he attends our sessions uh, regularly, right? Whenever he, he comes in, and, and all of us actually benefited a lot from, from sharing experience. And in that spirit, I think I think Joe is sharing uh, with, with us you know, some tips. So, without further ado, I think I'll give the uh, the, 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 the the stage to Joe. Thank you very much, Chuck. I think you tremendous round of applause. So one of the things that I also do is I do a bit of, a bit of lip reading, right? And uh, I saw one of the three people here say mm -hmm. uh, when when I was introduced. Uh, I think I think there's a there's a there's a lot to do here in terms of I'm just kidding about the lip reading by the way. Um, <laughs> I know for some of you I got to introduce myself again in terms of radio and stuff like that, and I know for some of you I'll have to ex explain what radio is. <laughs> it's this thing we used to listen to. Um, I want to welcome you to this. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I was um, asked by Chuck today to speak, and I said, uh, what, should, what should I talk about? And on one hand, I've been doing a lot of work with startups for the last, uh, last year, and Chuck suggested that I just uh, regale you with my stories of things that happened this year. And I, I thought to myself, I might be able to go for a few minutes with that, and then after a while, it's like, hmm, what else do you talk about? Oh, I could give you essentially my keynote, which is, um, as Chuck has mentioned, usually a much more paid for event. Um, so I decided to go with the, with the keynote um, that I prepared. So I hope you guys don't mind that. If we have time for stories and stuff, we'll, we'll do that as well. Uh, a quick introduction to myself, besides what Chuck said, I'm also Singapore's first possibly retired male model. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it usually gets a bigger laugh, but I think, I think now it's become more sad. <laughs> I want to I wanna start today by telling you a story. And the story is about someone I think most of you know. I hope, I hope uh, people won't forget the story of this guy. Steve Jobs, born 1925, uh, passed in 2011. Uh, he was the adopted son of two people, Paul and Clara Jobs. And you may have heard about the company he's founded. Yes? 
Um, the company he founded was with somebody else. It was someone who was at the time working at HP, uh, a real stylish guy, old guy called Steve Wozniak. Um, this is at, at the time of Jedi. And in 1976, he founded this company called Apple. Right? And within just four years, would you like to hazard a guess as to how much this company had become worth? This is in 1976 to 1980. How much do you think Apple was worth by 1980? 100 million? 100 million? We were talking about back those days money as well, yeah? 100 million? Do I have any other Ten guesses? Million. 10 million? You're being conservative, yes. Yourself? Uh, yeah. 5 million? Okay. Must do this now, ten million. Anyway, higher? Do I have higher? Incredibly, this company that was founded in 1976 from a garage was worth a billion dollars. That's one B in 1980. That's the size of the business that, that, that they helped create. Uh, it moved very quickly. By 1985, uh, Steve Jobs had reached out beyond the people in the industry, the nerds and all that, and went to get the real people to work. Right? So he hired this guy called John Scully, uh, who was uh, head of marketing at Pepsi. And famously, he told John Scully, you know, in his recruitment speech to John Scully, he said, do you want to you wanna sell sugar for the rest of your life, sell sugar water for the rest of your life, or do you want to change the world? Uh, this was apparently the, the phrase that really got John Scully to come across to, to Apple. Unfortunately, John Scully was also responsible largely for the ousting of Steve Jobs from his own company. So by 1985, just a few years after founding, less than 10 years, Steve Jobs found himself out of Apple. And at that time, what he did was he actually sold off all his shares except for one in Apple computers. I don't know what the sim symbol of that is, but he, he sold everything except one. So Steve Jobs then found himself with a, a little bit of money and not much to do. And he was trying to create something new as well at the time. And he thought since he had created the changes in desktop publishing through the Mac, that he would go into the next thing. And he thought video. He wanted to change the way the video was being done and also 3D. So what he did was he looked for a company that had the technology that he wanted, that he wanted to build into his uh, next computer, and he acquired them. Okay. Now, it turned out that this company that he acquired, uh, besides being pretty good at, at 3D rendering and stuff, were also pretty good at something else. They made some pretty good movies. And this is a bit of Steve Jobs, a bit of John Lasseter, who is the, uh, the, the creative guy uh, at Pixar. Uh, between the two of them, they created this thing called Toy Story, the very first full feature animated movie. Uh, and they did something which most companies don't do. You know, immediately after this big first product goes out, they went public. Right. So, Toy Story, just hot of the press, great reviews, open in cinemas, and then Pixar goes public. And few people know this, but that was actually the day that Steve Jobs became a billionaire. He didn't become a billionaire through Apple, he became a billionaire through, through Pixar. Uh, but back to this company that he was trying to develop, remember I was talking about getting a computer going? Um, he created this company called Next. It was supposed to be a for education, for academics. Uh, and in that, in that company, they're developing this operating system for this computer. Now, the computer company doesn't exist anymore, but something from that computer still exists today, at least in some form. Uh, so, uh, any of you use a Mac? Uh, yeah. Um, Mac OS 10, OS X, now it's 11, 12, um, actually was built for Next. So when Apple acquired Next and got Steve Jobs back into Apple, they got the operating system as well, and they went from there. So that's part of the story. When Steve Jobs came back to Apple, he had a very interesting situation. He had a company that he had built, had grown to a certain level, was now in trouble because uh, his share of the market had become very small. And when he arrived back at Apple, uh, something he didn't know before he arrived back at Apple, was they only had 90 days of cash left. 90 days of cash. Now. I, I don't know if you can imagine Apple today in a situation like that, but 90 days of cash. So what do you do when you are faced with that situation? When you're in an industry where basically the entire industry has, has copied what you do and everything is the same, all the things are the same. 
So Steve Jobs and the people at Apple came up with something different. Now, this is literally, I think, before you were born. Um, they introduced the world's Trendiest computer. Now, back in the day, PCs were saying plug and play, but what it actually meant was plug, set up, register, try and fix it. Maybe if you're lucky, you play. And they came up with, uh, with the iMac, which was as simple as back in the dial up day, as simple as just putting it on, uh, plugging it in, plugging it into the wall so that you had your modem, and you were literally set to go. So that's what they did. Uh, that changed the world. It changed the entire uh, way people use the internet. You know, and, and that one thing usually is enough for most companies, but they went on to do something else. They revolutionized the digital media business. Uh, iTunes. iTunes was created. Most people think the iPod came first. iTunes actually came first. It was a way to manage digital media. Then came along the iPod, which is still, I think, a, a sore point for creative technologies because they made the first, uh, or one of the first few. MP3 players. Um, and if that not, were not enough, they went on to kill Nokia, essentially. <laughs> uh, except in India, where they're still doing really well, Nokia. Um, created the MacBook, pushed the iPad through, iCloud. All these things which a lot of other people had tried to do, a lot of other companies had tried to do, but not really got the traction, they managed to get it through. So the question is, what's so special about Apple? And the answer to me is probably with Steve Jobs and how he was able to communicate his ideas. I mean, he has very demanding on one hand and he pushed people, but he was also very good at communicating it to other people and getting the word out there. So for me, I think that's one of the, the, the great skills that, that I've been studying for the last 20 or years. Uh, and I'm hoping to transfer some of that to you in this next why am I doing this? <laughs> why, why do we present? Right? I contend, and this is something which you might not believe right now or, or realize yet, but you are literally presenting to change the world. Because if you're not doing anything like that, then it isn't worthwhile. What, what you're doing is to change the world. Maybe not the entire world, but your part of the world that is, that is in your realm. Um, the power of presentations is to take what's inside your head, the ideas, the enthusiasm, um, the hope, what's inside your head, and transfer it to somebody else's head. And, and great presentations over time have done a lot of things. I mean, we've, we've had, of course, um, a change in history, the first black president ever. Uh, great presentations have led to people getting away with murder, at least for a while. And of course, in the case that we're talking about today, uh, great presentations and great presentation skills have led to, uh, I think, making the world a better place. Right. My personal reason for doing this is very simple. Um, I've been doing this for 25 years, now more than 25 years. And over the, the, that time, I've done literally hundreds and hundreds of corporate events. And during that time, I see lots of money being spent. There's money being spent on, on lighting equipment, and uh, sound equipment, and catering, and venues, and stuff like that. I just saw a bill uh, just yesterday, actually, for an event that's coming up. And just for the sound and lights, it's almost $20,000. So if you imagine this being multiplied over and over again, all around Singapore. And then understanding that many presentations that are going to come in the middle of all this are going to fail. They're not going to do what they were trying to do. They're trying to create excitement, but what's funny is they actually end up with this less exciting sort of thing. I don't know how many of you have been to a presentation where you're like, okay. Have you? Local launches? Have you been excited? No? Well, generally, some of you are falling asleep right now. Working hard will happen. Okay, so for me, this is it. I feel that Singapore is full of really talented people really good people. Uh, and and I, 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 I'll tell you this, <coughs> it is the older part of the room and the younger part of the room. And I know the younger part of the room, you guys know what you're good at and you have some, some, some sense of your skill. But I'll tell you that the older half really, really know that there's talent in Singapore. They really, really know and they have faith in the future that you guys are talking about. The 
question is, how can you tell who about that? How can you let other people know it so that they can value it? And that's what, if you understand how to do a good presentation, you'll be able to do it, okay? So, um, as Steve Jobs liked to say, when, uh, when he began one of these things, he said, let's get started. So I'm gonna get started right now, okay? Okay, so first things first about presentations. It's showbiz. It is showbiz. When you, when you talk about a presentation, any presentation, you have to think in terms of an audience. You have to think about people responding to what you say, people who see what you're going to say, who are going to hear your, your message, or who are trying to process your information. So this is the one thing that most people don't think about when they think about a presentation. I think for many people, it's like it's an assignment. It's a thing that's been thrust upon you. You have no choice. You have to do it. There's a meeting, whatever it is. Uh, it's seldom seen as this, this thing that could be a, a show. And so because you don't think of it as a show, you don't put the effort into it that you would into, into, into making a show happen, okay? So I'm gonna show you a little bit of video and um, a lot of material that I've, that, I've, that I've developed and built around some of the ideas that, that, that I get from Steve Jobs. Um, I want you to think about product launches and how things in general are introduced to you, right? And now I want you to think in terms of drama in terms of um, making things exciting or interesting. The scene is this. They've had 3,000 people come to a convention, and they've heard that Apple has some new announcement to make, uh, some they've introduced the new products, right? So at this particular point, the presentation has been going on for 30 minutes already. And in the time that's passed, Steve Jobs has introduced uh, Apple TV, and it's quite significant. But what happens then is he stops, he takes a sip of water, and then the mood changes. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along. That changes everything. And Apple has been, well, first of all, one's very fortunate if you get to work on just one of these in your career. Apple's been very fortunate. It's been able to introduce a few of these in the world. In 1984, we introduced the Macintosh. It didn't just change Apple. Change the whole computer industry.
These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, today Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Here it is. This is almost 10 years ago. This is going to be a 10th year anniversary of the <coughs> phone. Um, even though you knew what this product was, did you feel anything during this? Did you get any kind of sense of excitement? Yes. Right? A bit of a buzz. <laughs> so people wonder why Apple would come along and launch a product which you know, for, for the most part, if you, if you read the specs, which I did when I first saw the Apple, I heard about the Apple iPhone, I thought, why would I want this? Because I read the specs. Apple iPhone, touch screen, okay, cool. Um, 2G, mono speaker. Why would you want that? Low-end camera, 2 megapixel, megapixels of that. That was it. And, and the competition at the time was, you talk about Nokia N95, stereo, stereo 3D sound, uh, 3G, internet browser, maps, which was still not quite worked out in the, in, the, in the early iPhones. And yet, this came along and it caught everyone's imagination. It's stuff like this. It's, it's presentations like this that make an audience um, of, of 3,000 people, maybe maybe a few hundred of them are, are journalists and they all follow along and they go, you know what, I'm really getting into thing, I'm drawn into it. And when you talk about this, they all get excited. They, they forget about what an Nokia N95 is. Okay. So, um, when it comes to, to presentations, I, I'm gonna go through a few things that we have uh, some time for today. And some of the basics in terms of show this, right? One is, choose a theme. Choose a theme. If you, if you think about the last movie you saw, the last great movie you saw, or enjoyable movie you saw, it's very likely you can categorize it in some sort of theme. Yes? Any movies you saw? Sorry? Logan. Okay. What do you, what do you, how do you classify that movie? You tell a friend, have three words to tell a friend to describe it. Action. What else? You know, if you think about that, most things have some sort of theme. And the thing is, most times when you get to a, a, a presentation, there's no sign of any kind of theme. In fact, if there are four presenters, you will see four different kinds of presentations usually. No overall theme, no, no choice of lighting, no choice of sound. Why have a theme? It's very simple. If things fall within the theme, people begin to align with you. As in, like, when you talk about an idea within the theme, people begin to, to, to sort of organize it and put it aside and put it in a category that fits within the theme. So people begin to work for you instead of working against you. That's the importance of having a theme. We don't have time to get into all the, the details, but that's, that's what themes are about. So it can be about overcoming odds, it can be about family, it can be about love, it can be about revenge, whatever it is, you can come up with something. You can come up with something and follow the theme, right? Um, some of the wild classics, right? There's a there's a magic number in presentations. You heard of this? Okay, so you want to guess what the magic number in presentations is? Three. 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 Anybody else wants to play? Oh, there is a seven fifty-three. Seven fifty-three. Yeah, that's that one. What else? And the there's a seven ten words. Okay, that's the that's the ratios you're talking about, right? Okay. Um, the the answer is three. We, we usually have, I, I play it out a little bit more, make people bet against each other and all that. But the answer is three. And and where does it come from? Well, um, it's something that's described as the, the, the rule of threes. Now, it basically is is the idea that if you want to talk about anything, you want it to be memorable, you put it in threes. Now, this is not a new idea, by the way guy who came up with this particular rule, right, uh, lived in 
300 and in, the, in the 350 BC era. Uh, he's a guy who's, uh, who's called Aristotle. Now, as you, as you can tell, um, in the day, they didn't care very much for covering up men's nipples, but he also was, he, he, he's one of the guys that, that um, was regarded for the longest time after that as the philosopher. In fact, you, you, if you, if you uh, were to refer to the philosopher uh, in, the, in, in the years after his death, they would know you were talking about Aristotle, right? So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Before I get into the, the rule of threes a bit more, I'm also gonna to, to, to try to teach you a little bit of Greek, okay? Because Aristotle said a lot of really smart stuff, and and this is the this is the one that I hope you guys can, can learn to say as well, okay? Uh, it's Greek, and it's agoramnilio. Agoramnilio. Can can you guys say that with me? Agoramnilio. Agoramnilio. Okay. Translated way back then, he said. Buy Apple. <laughs> <laughs> no, but to be serious, he talked about the rule of threes to be memorable. And you see examples of the rule of threes being applied uh, through a lot of, uh, of uh, literature, right? So like in, um, in Julius Caesar by, by William Shakespeare, you know, friends, Romans, countrymen. It's a more memorable way of saying, my fellow, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a more memorable way of saying things, right? Um, Winston Churchill, you know, one of the great prime ministers of the UK during the wartime, you know, he could have said, I have nothing to give you but my effort. So we have nothing to offer but effort, right? But instead he said, I have nothing to offer but blood, sweat, and tears. And if you think this is a bit too complicated, you can do the ABBA thing and just repeat the word. <laughs> money, 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 okay? So what does it mean now in terms of making a point? If you're, if you're, if you're trying to make a point, you can see you've got this presentation, and you have four things to say, or you have five things to say, what happens then? And if you want to answer the guess. They don't even remember the last thing. Well, they may not remember much of it, but depending on how, you, you, the capacity for the mind to align stuff is, is limited, right? My advice, which is the hard advice, is to cut it down to three. And if you can't cut it down to three, and you have to make it a structure that maybe can fit into nine or three by three, then you work on that. But it takes discipline. It takes discipline for you to say, okay, now I've got five important things to say, which are the three most important things that I want you to does that make sense? Okay. Um, and why and why it works is very simple. Our minds are designed to to understand patterns. We're looking for patterns. And the first time something happens, it becomes something that, that moves away from what it's it's a, it's something that's a bit strange, it's different from the norm. So your mind goes, oh, okay, that's interesting. The second time something happens, your mind goes, oh, okay. I wonder if it's gonna happen again. The third time it happens again, your mind goes, yes. It, 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 it actually affirms a suspicion that it had. So if you want to put something important especially, put it on the third beat because the, your, your mind is trying to find some sort of solution and you can align that together with when your, your message comes out, it's more powerful. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, another aspect of presentations is how you dress. Uh, people who know me know that I usually don't dress like this. Um, but uh, I do it for the presentation. Uh, yesterday was actually quite strange. I was, I was just walking down Orchard Road and someone took a photograph of me, but I, I, uh, I didn't see that. Um, <laughs> <coughs> Photoshop it. Anyway, um, it, but, but at the same time, when I say, you know, you, you, quotes are important as well. You look, at, you look at this video of Steve Jobs um, and you wonder whether or not you should dress that way? Short answer is no, right? Uh, if you create a billion dollar company, dress however you want, right? But even, even this, this is not fully represented because he basically decided, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose a shirt design that I really like, and I'm, I'm gonna find these jeans that I like, I'm gonna buy 200 of them, and I'm gonna remove that decision from myself every day, and this is what uh, Zuckerberg 
does, and a few other famous people as well. They just take the whole fashion choice off the table. It makes them so much more efficient. Um, but when it comes to presentations, getting to people, uh, some of the looks that you have missed along the way, or maybe you've missed along the way, uh, include Steve Jobs when he was selling Apple as a computer to an industry. Very sharp. Um, Steve Jobs at a shareholders meeting, very much dressed up for the job. Or perhaps when you're trying to sell Macs computers to an academic world, you might look a bit different as well. Another very important thing now is about how do you try to convince people? How do you how do you change someone's mind? Or how do you make them come on board? Uh, it's a section I call before and after. Okay, so this is uh, before and this is after, all in the same place. Um, if you want to sell your solution, you first got to make me feel the impact of the pain. Now I'm not referring to this picture. I'm saying that if you want to, if you're, if you're, if you're, whatever your service is, is it's probably going to be a solution to some problem. What you should do first, and what people usually don't do, is make a big deal of the problem first. So, back in the time when the iPhone was being launched, uh, there were lots of other, you know, keyboards, uh, uh, phones around, the, the, the N95s, the Blackberries, and all these other computer, or other phones. Um, and people were really quite happy to have them. The, the Blackberry diehards will tell you that they love the Blackberries, right? Until Steve Jobs comes along and makes you aware of a problem. Now, why do we need a revolutionary user interface? I mean, here's four smartphones, right? Motorola Q, the Blackberry, Palm Trail, Nokia E62, the usual suspects. And what's wrong with their user interfaces? Well, the problem with them is really sort of in the bottom 40 there. It's, it's this stuff right here. They all have these keyboards that are there whether you need them or not to be there. And they all have these control buttons that are fixed in plastic and are the same for every application. Well, every application wants a slightly different user interface, a slightly optimized set of buttons just for it. And what happens if you think of a great idea six months from now? You can't run around and add a button to these things. They're already shipped. So what do you do? It doesn't work because the buttons and the controls can't change. They can't change for each application, and they can't change down the road if you think of another great idea that you want to add to this product. Well, how do you solve this? Hmm. It turns out we have solved it. We solved it in computers 20 years ago. We solved it with a bitmap screen that could display anything we want, put any user interface up, and a pointing device. We solved it with the mouse, right? We solved this problem. So how are we going to take this to a mobile device? Well, what we're going to do is get rid of all these buttons and just make a giant screen. A giant screen. Now, how are we going to communicate this? We don't want to carry around a mouse, right? So what are we going to do? Oh, a stylus, right? We're going to use a stylus. No. Uh, who wants a stylus? You have to get them and put them away, and you lose them. Yuck. Nobody wants a stylus, so let's not use a stylus. We're going to use the best pointing device in the world. We're going to use a pointing device that we're all born with. We're born with ten of them. We're going to use our fingers. We're going to touch us with our fingers. And we have invented a new technology called multi-touch, which is phenomenal. It works like magic. You don't need a stylus. It's far more accurate than any touch display that's ever been shipped. It ignores unintended touches. It's super smart. You can do multi-finger gestures on it. And boy, have we patented it. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll notice that Steve has got six points there. OK, um, again, so just suggestions. <laughs> All right, um, but you notice that one thing that, that, that you see about, about great presentations is there are ending points. Things really come to a close, and that point is made and rounded up. But let me tell you that, that that presentation influenced the way the whole stylus thing went for many, many years. Even, you know, you think most Apple fans are like, ooh, I don't touch a stylus, and then of course Apple comes along with this Apple pencil. <laughs> <laughs> Big different, right? Um, you'll notice something else as well in, in the way good presentations are done. Uh, you tell stories, right? And why you 
stories work. Uh, I don't know how we do it for time. Are we okay? Do we have time? Okay. Stories work because they tap into our survival instincts. And that might be the first time you've ever thought about that. But why do we tell stories to each other? It goes back to the fact that we had to survive in harsh conditions before. And stories were the way you found out about danger, you found out where the food was, you found out where the women were. And you find out about all those kind of things. So it's very important survival information. Uh, and that's why when you start telling a story, it's like hearing a story, you can't help yourself. You kind of want to understand what's going on. Sure, you come to a point where you go like, okay, I can ignore the story. But at the start of the story, if you're walking by, maybe in the hall somewhere or whatever it is, and walk past two people having a conversation, and then say, no, I told him not to try and do that to me. Are you just going to walk past and never find out what happened? Or are you going to try like, just find a reason to figure out what happened? It's just a, it's a human nature. So you can use that to your advantage. If you wrap your message in the story, it's very hard to resist the message. Because if I come up to you and I just tell you a message right now, I mean, you're here, you know, around here, every other time I'm downstairs, there's some other flyer coming my way, whatever it is, I'm, I'm really just trying to resist it, trying to be supportive, but I, I resist it. Um, if it's wrapped in a story, even if you're trying to resist it, you can't. So with that, this is a minute and a half story, try and resist the message that Steve is trying to give these students. Okay, just try and resist it. When I was young, there was an amazing publication called the Whole Earth Catalog, which is one of the Bibles of my generation. It was created by a fellow named Stuart Brand, not far from here in Menlo Park, and he brought it to life with this poetic touch. <coughs> this was in the late 60s, before personal computers and desktop publishing. So it was all made with typewriters, scissors, and Polaroid cameras. It was sort of like Google in paperback form 35 years before Google came along. It was idealistic, overflowing with neat tools and great notions. Stuart and his team put out several issues of the whole Earth catalog. And then, when it had run its course, they put out a final issue. It was the mid-1970s, and I was your age. On the back cover of their final issue was a photograph of an early morning country road, the kind you might find yourself hitchhiking on if you were so adventurous. Beneath it were the words, stay hungry, stay foolish. It was their farewell message as they signed off, stay hungry, stay foolish. And I have always wished that for myself. And now, as you graduate to begin to do, I wish that. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thank you all very much. So even if you know something is coming, you can't resist it. Right? That's the power of a, of a well-told story. Um, the next bit is about technology. And with technology, I want you to, 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 to be aware of something. I don't want you to get sucked in by it. You know, every time you look at some new gear, some new presentation tool, you know, you've got to get drawn in to try and use it. Some of you are looking at the screen right now. I can't help looking and see what's going to happen next as well because of this world scrolling thing. Um, this is actually where I usually talk about PowerPoint and, and, and how that technology was so irritating that Steve Jobs decided that he was going to create a whole new software for presentation as well. That's what Keynote is. Um, and one of the topics I'm going to talk about is bullets and how bullets kill. Use them wisely. Uh, what do I mean? How many of you have seen something like this? And most people can, can recognize that's not good. And I talk to people about presentations and I say, you know, would, would you, would you uh, what, what do you think is a problem? Oh, too many points, right? But why does it happen over and over again? Why does it repeat itself so often, right? The answer is very simple. When you open up your presentation software, it tells you what to do. And so you fill up this, this template, you follow it, you think that's the right thing to do. Okay, so here's my challenge to you. There are a few things about this, right? Uh, when you fill up bullets like that, people can run ahead of you and they can figure out things because bullet points tend to be laid out in your thought process, right? 
We tend to lay out the thought process. So if I can look through your bullets, I can kind of figure out what you're saying, right? But what's the point of a presentation? The point of a presentation is for me to guide you through the information, through the knowledge, through the experience, so that you end up with the thought that I have, okay? And if you don't control that, and you put everything up on the screen, it's, it's gonna happen that they are gonna run ahead of you, okay? So here's my challenge to you. When you look at your next presentation, to you, you have a look at overview of your slides. It should not make sense. It should not make sense. As in, if I just looked at the slides, I should not be able to figure out what you're trying to say. I'm not saying don't have notes, don't have explanations of what's going on when you submit it for, for, for approval and stuff. Don't do that. But I'm saying that if your presentation seriously doesn't require you to be there, that's a real problem. If all I have to do, in fact, the better version of a presentation sometimes is just if the person shuts up, then that's a bad presentation, it's a really bad presentation. All right? Cool. Um, yeah, this, uh, I think the reason why all this happens is very simple, it's because of the, 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 the process. Most times when someone has to make a presentation in school, at work, whatever it is, the bosses want to see it, or the, 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 the PR, or, or communications people want to see it as well, and you have to send it to these people, and they have to try and figure it out, and if they can't figure it out, they call a red flag, and, and uh, that's how it usually works. So this is something that I, that I really want to work with changing, right? Uh, less is literally more. Okay. Um, many of the, the presentations that you, that you hear about from Steve Jobs uh, used to last like an hour, an hour and a half, 90 minutes, and it's very normal for, for a presentation. And how, how would you hold someone's attention for that time is one key thing as well. But you'd imagine that there'd be a lot of words, right? But there are actually very few words in an Apple presentation, uh, and uh, I dare say many good presentations. In fact, you watch many good movies. They seldom spend that much time just using words to describe what's going to happen. And maybe the start of Star Wars is a, is a, is a good example of the, the, the start and the end, but very rarely in the middle do they sort of pop up and tell you all the details in words. And um, remember I was saying how you know, presentations are like movies, right? So you think about things like this, like, you know, um, you're talking about keywords to help you understand the main point You'll talk about how much video it can hold, what capacity it has, but you just need some keywords. You're gonna talk about how much power your mobile device has, describe it in these few keywords, and then talk a little bit more about it, because people are gonna look at you at, at the presentation. I'll spend some time summarizing what it is. What is the offer that your, your device has? Write the words for your audience. I think I'm gonna end after this, this next thing, there's, there's a lot more work, there's not enough time for this. Um, did you add any magic to your presentation? I'm not suggesting that you have to make something appear or do something weird like that, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that along the way, as your, as your presentation's un, 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 unraveling itself or unveiling itself, and I'm hoping even though this is a, I consider this a low energy presentation, along the way, your mind is going like, oh, oh, okay, wow. Right? Little things like that. And that's a challenge. Do you do any of that? Do you look for moments in that presentation and you go like, okay, how do I manage to do that? Uh, that's just a, a, a mindset thing. Another thing that I would ask you to consider is this idea of the inverse setup. Um, I'm gonna show you what's being done first. And then I'm going to tell you how it was done, and then I'll show it to you again, and then you see that, that, that you understand that process a bit more. Uh, but most times when people want to announce anything, we go in a very linear fashion, okay? I want you to just try and, and, and just, just watch this next short clip <coughs> and uh, just absorb what's happening, okay? The map is the only one that you really think of as a computer. Yeah. Well, it's So if I ask you very quickly what, what happened, what just happened there? 
What's the essence of what you just saw? You're saying that no longer just a computer company, but much bigger than that. Right. Well, they just they just changed the name of the company, right? That's what they changed. And then they, they had, you, you understand why as well because of the computer and all that. Uh, but how would most people do something like that? And it would make complete sense as well, right? Let's say you want to tell me that uh, next Tuesday is going to be, uh, or, or you have to go to school now on Saturdays as well, right? I would tell you that you have to go to school on Saturday, and here are the reasons why, because we've done the research, and we've done all that kind of stuff. I'll tell you, you know, I'll, I'll do that. That's the usual way I do it, right? The inverse setup is where I tell you the reasons first before I tell you what the news is. So if you look very carefully, if you listen very carefully, you'll find that while I'm giving you the reasons, you have no idea what you're resisting. There's nothing to resist because you don't know what it is, and you're just introducing the subject, setting up the point, so that by the time he tells you that the company has changed the name, instead of the usual reaction, which is, why are you going to change the name? You go like, oh yeah, that makes sense. All right? The map is the only one you really think of as a computer. And so we thought about this and we thought, you know, maybe our name should reflect this a little bit more than it does. So we're announcing today, we're dropping the computer from our name, and from this day forward, we're going to be known as Apple Incorporated. To reflect the product mystery we have today. Okay, so I think this next one, I just, I just, want, I just want to leave you with this uh, last idea. Um, many of us are very uncomfortable with using positive words to describe ourselves. We are, we are, we are ingrained with this Singapore thing of must be fair, even-handed, uh, you know, don't claim to be too much, whatever it is. And because of that, I think we are very uncomfortable with saying things like amazing, wonderful, incredible. Right? Uh, and, 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 and for those of you who hear this for the first time now, you go like, Sound, those words sound very heavy. They're gonna, they're gonna land. In fact, when you put them in the script, you go like, ooh, they look, they look, they look, they look like I have to, to, to meet some sort of standard. Okay, but let me just show you what it looks like when it's just, when it's just said. Okay. The iPod, in addition to being the world's best MP3 player, has become the world's most popular video player, and by a large margin. The iPod Nano is the world's most popular MP3 player by a wide margin. And the new Shuffle is the world's most wearable MP3 player. So we had an incredible lineup for this holiday season, all refreshed and new products. And I'd like to tell you a few things about iTunes now that are pretty exciting. Number one, we have crossed a major milestone. We have sold over 2 billion songs on iTunes. It's amazing. Now, there was, some, there was an article recently that said iTunes sales had slowed dramatically. I don't know what data they're looking at, but uh, this is our data, and what we see is iTunes sales were really up this past year. Uh, it took us over three years to get to a billion songs we got our second billion in 10 months in 2006. And growing off us, over 600 million song base, we doubled it in 2006. So we couldn't be happier with the growth rate of iTunes and selling 2 billion songs. Now we are selling over 5 million songs a day now. Isn't that unbelievable? 5 million songs a day. That's 58 songs every second of every minute of every hour of every day. Okay, so you hear all those buildings there? It's, it's amazing, unbelievable, fantastic. Uh, it's, it interprets the news for you, it's exciting. We think it's very exciting. Now, why is that important at all? It's because ultimately people are gonna to try to interpret what you say. Shouldn't you try to influence what they're gonna interpret it as, right? So as, uh, as, as Bobby Farron once said, <laughs> don't worry, be happy, just be, comfortable with what you have to say about yourself. Use words that will help guide people in how you will remember or how they will remember you. Because right? they're always trying to figure out how am I going to categorize this? Was this an interesting presentation? Was it wonderful? Was it happy? Was it, you know, what, what was it? Was it all these things? Um, 
use those words, get comfortable with them, and you don't have to shout them every time they're said, but just say like, this is, this is really awesome, we're so excited about the way things are done here, we think it's incredible, uh, this is gonna be a, a fantastic ride. Yeah? Okay, so that's kind of all the time that I want to take, because I saw Pizza arrive, and I know it's a very significant moment for this particular <laughs> I wanna thank you for your time and your attention, and if you'd like to find out more about what I do, if you'd like to, to help uh, the organization or yourselves do better presentations, um, you know, feel free to contact me, feel free to contact Chan, and uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll be working together. Yeah. Uh, one final thing, if I can, is this. Okay? If you want people to pay more attention to your presentations, then you have to pay more attention. Especially if you know what you're talking about. Yeah. If you don't, it's very easy to fluff it up. Does that help? No, I didn't get it, sorry. <laughs> um, to prepare for it, I, I mean, one of the things you should do is you should just keep thinking about the topic. You run it over your head. And one, one bit of advice that I gave somebody uh, the other day is you should not be writing in the moment. What I mean by that is, as, as you say something from stage or as you answer a question like, like this right now, um, as much as it sounds like I'm putting all these words together in the moment, it's not truly the first time that I've been thinking about this, right? So for what you're gonna say on stage as well, you should develop a number of set pieces. You should think about maybe the five to 10 things that you need to say about your company, about yourself, whatever it is, in a, in a, in a pre-packaged way. So what you can do is you can edit on the fly. You can decide to tell the story about this or the fact that you do this, whatever it is, but when you tell it, it's not like you trying to figure out how you're gonna tell it. You already know how to tell it. Does that make sense? Uh, Joe, just to ask, do you think yeah. it's possible if, let's say, you're doing a presentation, what most people like to do is like paint up a scope of the presentation to give some sort of structure to the people to follow. Do you think that's recommended? Okay. Um, I, I I don't like that because for me it's like can you imagine if you went to see Star Wars? Okay, first of all, everybody has seen uh, the, the latest Star Wars movie, right? So be a spoiler if I mention it. Okay, can you imagine if during the start of the show they tell you that okay, here's what's going to happen, right? They're all going to try and escape. They're going to get here. They're going to get the ship. They're going to blah blah blah. And in the end, they all die. <laughs> okay, let's watch the show. <laughs> right, and and, and that's what an agenda to a presentation tends to be because you are, you are, you are you're removing all the twists and turns. But what you can do, like a trailer would do, is sort of give a teaser and say like, you know, what's gonna happen today is we're gonna show you a number of very exciting innovations. Uh, you're gonna be the first to see it and we wanna get your feedback. So what's gonna happen, what, what's gonna happen is, you know, uh, we're gonna have lunch at about three o'clock today, um, but before that, um, let's get this, this thing rolling. Do a trailer rather than a, than, a, than, a, than a full exposition. And it'll be sufficient to capture the interest of the rest. Of the if you've done your job with the trailer, I mean, you know, that's that's how that's how trailers are supposed to work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Just one more question for the younger ones here. Right. What is one of two what what one of two tips that you have if you are you know have a stage fright? Yeah. Right, because you need to go up there and you present, right? So sometimes you go up there and you blank out. Yeah. Is there any tips you know, that you could? Okay. Um, if, you, if you're all in the, the, the startup world, you, 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 you all understand the idea of failing often, right? Conceptually, you understand that you're supposed to fail often and reiterate on that. And I'm going to tell you that this is actually what you need to do in this business as well, in, in your presentations. You are you're going to fail. You're going to make a presentation where you're going to really regret what you just said. You're going to tell a joke which in your head was so much funnier than the audience thought it was. <laughs> right? And it'll kill you. 
it's going to make you feel horrible in that time. But come to terms with the fact that that is the case, and that's where you will grow. You know, like they did that. Is it all? I can't remember who said it now, but you know, if you're, if 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 you find yourself running or you find yourself uh, walking through hell, walk faster. Right? Because you want to get through it. You don't want to stay there. You want to get through it. Uh, get some practice. Go out there. Do it. Know that you will fail. Celebrate the facts that you the, the, the times that you did well. Look at the stuff where you failed and go like, you know what? That, that's, that's the proof that I was trying. Uh, Stephen King has a great story he tells about writing. And he was, he was a, a struggling writer at some point trying to get people to publish his, his stories. And he was trying to write for magazines, so little short pieces. And he would send all these scripts out to various editors of various magazines. And you know, as you as you do that, what you're gonna do is you're gonna, you're gonna get rejection letters, right? Now, most people take a rejection letter and maybe throw it away or maybe whatever. Uh, Stephen King did this. He put a hammer to a nail and put it in the wall and he put the rejection letters on that nail. And it got to a point where he had to replace the nail with a spike and he kept putting on the rejection letters. And um, for him, that was a source of confirmation that he was trying, that he was doing what needed to be, do, needed to be done. Because if you don't try, you don't get those rejection letters, right? So with public speaking, or with anything like presentations as well, um, if you don't tell a joke that doesn't work, if you don't do a presentation that people didn't quite understand, if you don't do a presentation that people actually fall asleep, if you don't have that kind of experience along the way, then you haven't been doing it enough, you're not trying hard enough. Does that scare you or inspire you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope it's enough. Yeah. All right, with that, thank you very much. Just a couple of things. Uh, pizza is here, right? Uh, uh, next week we will resume the meeting downstairs at the corner room uh, in uh, in Ivy City Center. Next week is very interesting. We have uh, John Tan, right? Uh, ex deputy principal of uh, Yap Nai Poly, and now he is the CIO in uh, Startup, right? He's going to share with us actually his journey, right? And as well as some technology he used, right, to help him in in, in actually his journey, you know. Uh, in a fast pace, fast moving, you know, uh, uh, um, industry. All right. So, um, thank you all. <laughs> I'm going to share this time with them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you all. See you next week. <laughs> Let's eat now.